Welcome to the Modern Law Library. I'm your host, Lee Rawls, and today I'm joined by Larry Tai, author of Demagogue, The Life and Long Shadow of Senator Joe McCarthy. Larry, thanks so much for joining us. Lee, great to be with you today. So when I was growing up and going to grade school in the 80s and 90s, Joe McCarthy was talked about, but he was almost a boogeyman figure. And I would say, aside from that caricature, I didn't know a lot of details about him before reading your book. Was that also where you kind of came to Joe McCarthy? How did you become interested in him as a subject? I became interested for several reasons. The first was for my last book, which was a biography of Bobby Kennedy. Of the 450 people I interviewed for that book, only one of them was really essential, and that was a woman named Ethel Kennedy, Bobby's widow. And Ethel said something to me about Joe McCarthy that I couldn't get out of my head. It was that Joe McCarthy might have been a monster to much of America, but to Ethel and Bobby, he was just plain good fun. And I grew up hearing a lot about Joe McCarthy, but the words good fun were certainly not among adjectives I used to describe him. So trying to understand why the Kennedys became so attached to him, these iconic liberal figures of Ethel and Bobby, that was one reason. The other was I had been convinced that Joe McCarthy's story was a story of ancient American history until the 2016 election. And the day after that election, it became clear, given what was going on in America, that this was the story of today. So let's begin our discussion of Joe, like you did, with his early life. It, it's a little bit of a strange one to me. The timeline of his life is actually quite short. He died when he was only 48. But he did seem to have a real driving ambition but a strange background. Could you talk a little bit about, for instance, his, his schooling in his early days? So his schooling ended in the eighth grade, like it did for many kids who grew up in rural Wisconsin and whose family were farmers. And the, they were needed on the farm. Joe McCarthy, after the eighth grade, actually launched a bit of a chicken empire. He bought a bunch of laying hens. Um, the flock grew he was actually written up in a poultry magazine as being a boy chicken tycoon. And he might have made his fortune and his living there. We would never have heard of him had a virus not swept through his flock and killed most of the chickens. And that sent him off in a different direction. He went to work for a grocery store chain. His store in that chain quickly became the most successful in the operation. And he might have gone in that direction and become a grocery entrepreneur, except he decided at age 20 that he had higher ambitions and that he needed more education. And so he did something unusual. At age 20, he went back to high school and he finished four years of high school in a single year, which showed partly his determination and partly if anybody had any doubts that he was not just resolute but he was really smart and he finished four years, did very well, and then decided to go on to college. And after college, he did become a lawyer. Is that right? He did indeed. Um, he became a lawyer in college, switching halfway through. His first two years were in engineering. His second two years were in law. And he was enough of a quick learner that he could skip classes and just go to the study groups and pick up things that his colleagues, his fellow students were saying in the study group and do enough to finish Marquette University Law School with not just a degree, but with enough high grades that he would have an easy time launching a career in the law. And he did that for what seemed like five minutes before his political ambition bit. And this also began, what seems to me just reading the book as kind of the cycle, which is he runs for something, he fails spectacularly, he runs for another thing, he succeeds. And this is how he became a circuit judge at 31. Did that seem to be where he wanted to end up ultimately? I mean, a circuit judge position is the height of power for many, many people. It is. So that would have been plenty for most people. I'd actually like to, if we could revisit the first time he ever ran for office. And I think he sort of set a template for what he would do later. 
He's back in Marquette Law School. He's running for president of his law school class, and he's running against a really good guy named Charlie Curran. And McCarthy and Curran agree on one thing, which is that they will each do the gentlemanly thing, which is vote for the other one. And in the first round, they did that, and it came out a dead tie. When they had the tiebreaker election, McCarthy won by two votes. Charlie Curran's vote for him and his vote for himself. Curran said, you went back on your word. How could you do this? This is really outrageous. And McCarthy gave a classic Joe McCarthy answer, which is, I was telling everybody in the class to vote for the best man, and how could I do anything less? Well, that's where the story generally ends, but I think in fairness to McCarthy, we have to go one step beyond that. And that is not long after that, when Charlie Curran's father died, the first person to go and express his remorse was Joe McCarthy. McCarthy borrowed a car, borrowed money for gasoline for that car, and went to Charlie Curran's father's funeral. And that so impressed Curran that any time for the rest of his life, Curran would tell the story about that first election, he would punctuate it by saying, I think Joe McCarthy actually proved himself to be a decent guy, and I've been a fan of his for the rest of my life. And that is what Joe McCarthy managed to do. He managed to do any time he was running for office, whatever it took, and I mean anything, including breaking his word to win that office, but he also at the same time managed to charm people in his orbit the way he did Bobby and Ethel Kennedy, the way he did Charlie Curran, and the way he did enough voters in the state of Wisconsin that he would be elected not just their circuit judge, but twice be elected by substantial margins as their U.S. Senator. There's also an interval here where World War II comes in, and he actually joined the Marine Corps at 34. One of the things that surprised me about that was the litany of health problems that he suffered with his entire life, sometimes caused by alcohol, and sometimes just seemed like poor health, bad luck. What was his motivation in joining the Marine Corps, do you think? So I think his motivation was partly political because he saw that a guy he anticipated someday would be his political rival, the mayor of Milwaukee, sign up for the armed services during World War II. And Joe McCarthy had an easy out. Circuit judges were considered essential enough positions that he didn't have to serve. He was exempt from the draft and he would have had a legitimate reason to explain to voters why he never went to war. But that wasn't enough for Joe McCarthy. He had high ambitions. He wanted to show not just that he was willing to serve his country, but that he was intending someday to come back and look like and run for office as a war hero. So he signed up, he got a commission, even though he said that he had signed up as a buck private, he got a commission. He was sent off to the South Pacific Islands um, in the Marine Corps, which is the branch of the military he had signed up for. And while his World War II assignment was being a land-based intelligence officer, he volunteered for a much more dangerous duty going up in planes under enemy fire and actually serving as a tail gunner. And we know this, he claimed that back in the day, but we thought that he was lying. The press thought that he was lying, much of the public thought that he was embellishing because he was known as such an embellisher. But we now have access, I was given access to McCarthy's personal and professional papers that his widow left 60 years ago to Marquette. And we can see his real-time handwritten diaries from that South Pacific Island. We can see testimonies submitted by his squad mates there, confirming that he deserved the 12 medals he was awarded, and that when he came back and ran for Senate, calling himself Tail Gunner Joe, he was actually telling the truth. I do have to say, as a reader, one of the fascinating things to me about this book is seeing the genuinely heroic or genuinely what we would consider good things he did. Even those things were overshadowed by his other pretty horrific choices. So it's interesting to me that actually, no, Tail Gutter Joe was, was indeed accurate. And it's, were you surprised too? Did you think that you were going to find that he had been basically hoaxing people? 
So I was convinced that I was going to find that. And like you, Lee, I was not just surprised. To me, it was affirming to see that in some ways, Joe McCarthy looked better than we had ever imagined he was. And when you lie enough, when you're telling the truth, people don't believe you. And he was telling the truth about critical parts of his own biography that we can now say things like he was a war hero. And yet, in looking through all these unplumbed documents, there were other places that he looked even more sinister than he was. And you and I both know that in the world, it's never a question of somebody being all good or all bad. They only seem compelling when they seem flesh and blood and we can see ways that they were more charming than we might have imagined and ways that they were more vile than we imagined. And Joe McCarthy gave us plenty of both. I'm not remembering who said this phrase, but one of the ones that stuck with me after reading the book was that he was not immoral. He was amoral. And somehow that's almost more frightening. <laughs> it is more frightening. It's more frightening for a number of reasons. The answer on who said it is plenty of people said it because <laughs> it was so incredibly stark in looking at who this guy was. And if somebody believed in something deeply, whether it was something that you and I thought was terrible or not, at least we could say that was their standard. They were living up to their own sense of what was right and what was wrong. With Joe McCarthy, that sense changed so often. And he was, if there was a single word other than immoral that characterized him, it was opportunistic. He would take whatever chance he saw to get where he wanted to go. And that meant when he ran for his first office in rural Wisconsin, to be the local district attorney. He was running not just as a Democrat, but as a New Deal, FDR-loving Democrat. When he realized that wasn't gonna play in rural Wisconsin, sometime, probably in the middle of the night when nobody was looking, he went and changed his party registration to Republican. And he wasn't just a run-of-the-mill Republican, he represented, he ran for office as part of the most conservative part of the Republican Party in Wisconsin. They were known as stalwart Republicans, and that happened to be the opening to take on the progressive Republican Bob LaFollette. And if that was the opening, Joe McCarthy was going to take it. And if that meant reworking everything that he said he believed in, he was going to take that opportunity too. Another period of his life that may kind of reflect that to me was this sort of strange incident of an investigation into the Malmody massacre. Now, he is a World War II veteran. Uh, now, he fought in the Pacific, not in Europe. But during the investigation into the Malmody massacre, he goes to bat for a whole bunch of SS soldiers. Could you please talk a little bit about this interlude in his life? Sure. So for those of our listeners who aren't World War II buffs, um, they might remember this famous battle near the series of battles near the end of the war called the Battle of the Bulge. And in that Battle of the Bulge, there was an early incident near a Belgian village called Malmedy, where a number of American troops were quickly overwhelmed by the Germans, by an SS Panzer division. They raised their white surrender flags, and the SS troops ignored that. They mowed some of them down with machine guns, they killed others with their rifle butts. Those who had escaped that and gone into this little cafe were burned out. It was the deadliest single incident of World War II involving American troops. And it was part of the early Nuremberg trials after the war. We hunted down the perpetrators, we tried them, we convicted them, we sentenced them to death, and everything was going along smoothly until a number of ex-Nazis a number of peace activists and exactly one U.S. senator said something is wrong here. McCarthy was claiming not just that we were imposing what he called victor's justice, but that we had been so overly aggressive in the prosecution and tortured witnesses into confessing. And he said, especially terrible in terms of what had gone on at Malmody, was that Jewish prosecutors who couldn't be objective had gone overboard. Now, I think looking back, the Senate committee set up to investigate all of this said, you're entirely wrong. The full Senate endorsed the findings of that committee. 
And history has shown us, including in a recent book just on that Malmody incident, that Joe McCarthy got it wrong. One of the questions that that raises to me is, was it accidental that he got it wrong and well-intentioned? Was it appealing to what he thought might be a sympathetic vote in Wisconsin, which had a large German-American population? And was it Joe McCarthy reflecting anti-Semitism? And I think the answer on that last critical question is sadly yes, because it wasn't just at Malmody, it was later on in using slur expressions like Heeb and like Sheeny, and it was in his later anti-communist crusade going after disproportionate number of Jews. And it is not just me saying that, it was back then a civil rights group called the Anti-Defamation League, which also was astounded at the seemingly not accidental way that McCarthy was going after targeting Jewish alleged communists. And he did at least seem to believe part of this, you know, vast conspiracy. You talk about he's showing, I believe it was a reporter, he, he's showing them documents and saying, look, look, see, it's the smoking gun that, that this all is a conspiracy. And the reporter looks and he's like, I don't, what are you talking about? That has nothing to do with anything. Oh, well, well, it's there. And then it's still after that, that he does his famous, you know, I'm holding a list of, what is it, 205? I'll let you tell the story since you wrote the book. But it's, it's still after this that he starts his most well-known anti-communist crusade. It is. So... Again, um, we talked a minute ago about Malmody in 1949 and McCarthy getting involved in a lot of this um, investigation of it. A year later, he's still out there searching desperately for an issue that will prevent him from taking the trajectory that it looks like his career was about to take, which was him being a, a know-nothing, one-term U.S. senator. So he was searching for some issue that would give him the spotlight. And he shows up on February 9th, 1950, in an out-of-the-way community, Wheeling, as his staff referred to it, Wheeling, West by God, Virginia. He shows up there to give the famous Lincoln Day dinner speech. And that's a, a, an important date on every Republican's calendar when the grand old party holds fundraisers and invites somebody important to speak to them. Now, if you're a senator who matters, you're getting invited to places like Washington or Chicago, uh, Boston or New York. When you're a senator like Joe McCarthy, you're getting invited to somewhere like Wheeling, West Virginia. He shows up there that night with a big briefcase containing two speeches. One of them is a snoozer on national housing policy, which was a topic he actually knew something about. And Lee, had he given that speech that night, 70 years later, you and I wouldn't be here talking about him. But instead, he reached deeper into his briefcase. He pulled out a barn burner of a speech. And the setting at the time, we have to understand to understand the speech. The setting is in 1950 America, we are petrified about the Soviet threat. We've recently seen the atomic spies, the Rosenbergs, Julius and Ethel, and Ethel be captured, be tried, be sentenced to death. We've watched nationalist China turn into red China. And we're actually about to teach our school kids that in the event of an atomic attack, they should do what was called duck and cover, put their hands over their head and duck under their desk, and they'll be fine. And it is in that context that Joe McCarthy pulls that second speech out of his briefcase. And that speech he holds up in his right hand, and he says, I have in my hand a list of 205 spies at the U.S. State Department. They're people that President Truman should have known about, that he should have rooted out, and that are making us unsafe. Now, what he in fact had in his hand that night might have been a grocery list. It might have been nothing. Even having access to all of his papers, we see so many different versions of that speech that nobody is exactly sure. But what we do know is it was not 205 spies at the State Department. If they existed, Joe McCarthy didn't know about him. The names that he had were often people who were no longer working at the State Department. But what was much more important is that he had the issue 
he had been searching for. Within two days, Joe McCarthy was on page one of every newspaper in America. That night, McCarthy was taking off, McCarthyism was born, and he never looked back. And you mentioned, you know, he's an opportunist. He's not necessarily staking out this territory for the first time. One thing I hadn't really been familiar with is Truman on March 21st, 1947, creates this thing called the loyalty order. So can we talk about, so three years ago, what was happening in the government? What were they starting to do to government employees? They were starting to take 5 million government employees or applicants for government slots and essentially treating them like they were all guilty until proven innocent. They had to prove their loyalty. And I think if we had named the movement, this crusade against communism, by the person who actually originated it, rather than the one who was the showiest and the most captivating personality, we might have called it Trumanism. Because the idea of suggesting that you work for the, for the federal government and you have to somehow prove your loyalty seemed to me an un-American kind of approach to a problem. There was a problem of Soviet spies. By the time Truman's loyalty program, and certainly by the time Joe McCarthy's crusade came along, most of the 24 carat ones were captured or were long gone. And the idea of Truman subjecting everybody to this suggests the kind of a fervor there was back then. Truman said he was doing it to head off the efforts of more partisan and less restrained characters like Joe McCarthy. But I think that's a poor excuse. And it's just, again, as I say, a tenor of those scary times. So some of the more heartrending images of the book to me come from the children of some of these people who ended up targeted. So let's say you're an employee at the State Department, maybe mid-level, maybe high level, and suspicion has now been turned on you. What can your family expect? So I had a whole chapter called The Body Count that tried to look at that. It tried to look at what happened to McCarthy's targets. And what I found out was that nearly a dozen of them actually took their own life. And I'd love to, if I could take one second and tell a quick story about one of that dozen, because I think he captures what Joe McCarthy's effect on people turned out to be. And that was a guy named Ray Kaplan, an engineer at the Voice of America, who was caught up in McCarthy's web of accusations that the Voice of America was actually uh, sabotaging our efforts to get propaganda on the other side of the Iron Curtain. And Ray Kaplan was due to testify in front of McCarthy. And he took a trip just before his, he was scheduled to testify to MIT, where the people he had been working with on citing the transmitters for Voice of America equipment to meet with these people and to say to them, look, McCarthy is about to accuse me of bad things. I want you to stand behind me and say that there was, as there was, real science involved here and not any effort to sabotage anything. He gets to MIT, he can't find the engineers he's looking for. He is leaving campus when a truck is driving down the street on Massachusetts Avenue just in front of the MIT campus. And as the truck driver would say later, he slowed down when he saw Ray Kaplan approaching the street. But Ray Kaplan ran out in front of his truck, was crushed, was killed, and they found out after the fact that he had left a suicide note to his wife and children and, and young child, um, young son, saying, look, I did nothing wrong, but I just couldn't take the pressure. More than half a century later, I tracked down Ray Kaplan's supervisor at The Voice of America, a guy named George Jacobs. And I said, look, when somebody kills himself, there are all these things potentially involved. I don't want to point the finger at Joe McCarthy if he wasn't responsible. And I will never forget what George Jacobs said. He said quite simply, if there had been no Joe McCarthy, we would still have Ray Kaplan. And that is what the children and the colleagues and people associated with a dozen other victims of McCarthy told me, that they committed suicide because of Joe McCarthy. Hundreds of other people's careers were smashed. Millions of people were silenced were maybe leftists, were maybe just liberals, and felt like if they spoke out and said the things that they believed in politically, 
they would get bulldozed. And to this very day, if you are accused of being a socialist, that can end the conversation. You are automatically besmirched and slandered in a way that it is difficult to recover from. And I trace a lot of that back to Joe McCarthy in the 1950s. You know, one of the other moments during my reading that I was taken aback was one of the the smoking gun accusations against one young attorney was that, oh, well, he'd belonged to the National Lawyers Guild. And I was like, wait, I know that. Oh, I know that name because I follow them on Twitter. <laughs> and then I thought, Dangerous. Oh. Hey, Lee, <sighs> what's your affiliation? And that's maybe we got to worry about you. That's the, mean, that is the kind of accusation. It was the young lawyer that you're talking about. It was a guy named Fisher. It was during the famous Army McCarthy hearings, the most highly publicized and famous hearings that Congress had ever held, looking at Joe McCarthy's battle with the Army. And a very smart lawyer from Boston named Joe Welch is representing the Army against McCarthy. And McCarthy raises the issue of Welch's young associate named Fisher, says that he's been involved with this allegedly leftist group, the National Lawyers Guild, and essentially is slandering this young lawyer. Welch proceeds to utter what may have been the most famous lawyer, uh, words a lawyer had ever uttered in a Senate hearing or anywhere in America to that point. And the words were, Senator, have you no sense of decency at long last? Have you no decency? Those words seem to make the entire country that had tuned into those hearings utter a singular gasp and basically wonder the same thing about Joe McCarthy. And those words, which were thought to be spontaneous, seemed to end Joe McCarthy's career. We now know a little bit more about those words. We know that Joe Welch had had in his back pocket throughout the hearings that phrase, Senator, have you no sense of decency? And knowing that McCarthy would do something outrageous, whatever the most outrageous thing seemed to be, Welch was ready to go into his acting role and deliver that incredible line. We also know now that it was not just Welch's line that stopped Joe McCarthy in his tracks. It was the fact that for months, Americans had been watching the televised hearings and had been seeing that the guy they started the hearings believing was their champion, in fact, looked more like the town bully. And that's why I think all of America gasped when Joe Welch said what they were thinking. And what a moment for a trial attorney to seize on. Now, Joe McCarthy on his own, I don't think could have accomplished everything he did very clearly. Could we talk a little bit about both his staffers and his wife? I'd love to hear a little bit more about them, the people who most closely backed him. Yes. So his staffers were willing to do anything that Joe McCarthy asked them to. And there's one staffer, well, there are two staffers in particular that history remembers. One was a guy that we've already talked about named Bobby Kennedy, who had just graduated from law school. Papa Joe Kennedy had given enough money to Joe McCarthy that when Kennedy called McCarthy and said, hire my son, McCarthy said, okay. And he did, and he hired him for the number two job in the McCarthy office. And Bobby Kennedy stayed there for five and a half months and stayed Joe McCarthy's pal until the end of McCarthy's life. The other staffer, and possibly the most famous one associated with Joe McCarthy, is a guy named Roy Marcus Cohn, a brilliant and arrogant young lawyer from New York who came to work for McCarthy in the beginning of 1953 when McCarthy took over the chairmanship of the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, Roy Cohn proceeded to reinforce every bad instinct in Joe McCarthy and became a central figure in his crusade and in his downfall in this battle with the U.S. Army. Uh, But you asked about the staffers and the spouse. And I'd like to just say a couple words about Jean, Joe's smart wife. She was probably smarter than him. When I was reading anything attributed to McCarthy in the course of my research, I assumed that if it was well-written, it had been written by Jean, who went to work for him first as his staffer, and then they fell in love with one another, and she became his wife. And she was, at the beginning, at the very beginning, one of his truest believers, and at the end, 
when much of America had abandoned Joe McCarthy, she stayed a true believer. She loved the guy, she believed in his crusade, and she believed that he was a noble guy telling the truth and telling the hard truth that America had to hear. It was an interesting courtship that they had, and it, it went on a long time, and the wedding itself was so strange as I'm reading about it, and the number of people who are involved in the extravagance of the wedding presents. And that was that was something that I definitely recommend this book for, uh, for my readers, is just to get into that section of his personal life. And she also witnessed the extent of his alcoholism and health problems. One of the things that people thought he was lying about or faking was his state of health. And people said, oh, well, you know, he was he was only retreating to the Navy hospital for X reason. But you actually were able to see his medical records. Is that right? It was. So one day, um, I live on Cape Cod, and one day, my wife and I and our dog were out for a very early morning walk. And there was an enormous brown box at the head of our driveway. And I had no idea what it was. She said, let's open it up. And I said, it will be there at the end of our walk. Well, thankfully, it wasn't raining, and the box was there at the end of our walk, and it was documents that I had been requesting for two years and was convinced I wasn't going to get, which is all of his medical records. Thousands of papers documenting in incredibly vivid detail Joe McCarthy's alcoholism from the time he was a U.S. senator to near the end of his life when he was drinking a fifth of whiskey a day. It also made clear, and I sat down and reviewed these documents, with the recently retired dean of the Harvard Medical School and the retired editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine because I didn't trust my judgment. And it was very clear that he didn't die of what the coroner told us he died of. The coroner said he died of acute hepatitis. That was, in fact, a fig leaf to protect his family from the stigma of his dying from what he really died from, which was being an out-and-out alcoholic At the end of his life, he had the DT's delirium tremens, and it was incredibly sad how he went out of the world. And it was, to me, an explanation for some of his excess during his Senate years, realizing that he was impaired in his judgment at his hearings and other places. In fact, you know, you say that there are people who could testify to the fact that he was you know, drinking during the hearings. He would take a a break in the coat closet and and down some alcohol. Um, So he absolutely did that, and there are people who testify to that. I also, one of the other sets of documents that nobody had fully explored before were the 9,000 pages of his transcripts of closed-door hearings. Two-thirds of McCarthy's hearings when he was a senator were behind closed doors, and when he closed the doors, we saw Joe McCarthy unhinged. But we only saw that recently when those transcripts were made public, and they made clear that in the morning, when Joe McCarthy was conducting the hearings and when he was sober, his questions were more sober-minded. In the afternoon, after his trademark lunch of a hamburger, a raw onion, and whiskey, you didn't want to tangle with McCarthy in the afternoon or into the evening. He lost his patience more quickly. Any notion of the accused having any rights was thrown out the window. They were treated like the guilty parties that he thought that they were. And he used those closed door hearings as a way of testing out which witnesses would hold up under his grilling, and those witnesses never made it into public sessions, and which ones would easily cave, and those were the ones he was most likely to keep around when he invited the public and the cameras back in. And I'd love to talk about some of these witnesses because we've mentioned, you know, he was targeting people in the State Department or who worked for Voice of America. You know, we know that that Hollywood figures have been targeted by these hearings and we know the Army McCarthy hearings. But I had no idea the scope of people who got pulled in. Um, You were like one of the one of the men who was facing questioning was a science teacher at Bronx High School. And you're like, so what? Exactly. Looking at that kind of level that he was going down to the science teacher at the high school and not just calling them in for grilling, but seeming to delight in the fact that he knew that this teacher would automatically be fired 
because they had been called before a congressional committee questioning their loyalty. And he was calling in people who had long service in the government, whose any question of their loyalty or of leftist leanings often dated back a generation to their days in college or to a sister-in-law, a brother-in-law, some distant relative. It was guilt by association. It was guilt by the having supposed bad judgment when you were a kid. It was guilt by things that you had no control over at all. And it was incredibly unfair. And it was said about Joe McCarthy, this is not to say, none of what I'm saying is to say that there wasn't a threat of communist subversion back in those days. But what Joe McCarthy's friends jokingly said about him was that he could have been dropped into the middle of Red Square on May Day and had no idea on how to pick out a real communist. And I think that joke is in fact true. And I think that Joe McCarthy, in the end, ended up doing at least as much damage to the anti-communist movement in America as he did to the communist cause. One thing that may also be telling is that although he did target many colleges and universities, you say he never did go after his own state's university at Madison College, the uh, University of Wisconsin at Madison, which even to this day is seen as, you know, a real liberal school, but, but Joseph McCarthy never targeted them. He didn't, and that was, again, for a very calculated reason. He understood what any state school, and especially a great one like the University of Wisconsin, what role that held in the psyche of Wisconsinites, that they cherished their school, they had kids or parents who had gone there, and the idea of taking on an institution like that that could cost him electorally in Wisconsin was a step too far for him. Much safer to take on the Harvard University, which his supporters called Kremlin on the Charles, or to take on CCNY City College in New York, where McCarthy assumed that all he had to do was say CCNY, and he didn't have to mention that that was a place infested by communists because everybody would realize that. It was association again by alma mater. McCarthy could not have done this if there was sustained pressure against him from the beginning. And you have an entire chapter called Enablers. Who do you see as really enabling his rise to power and the damage that he did? So I want to mention briefly four groups of enablers. One was the wealthy people, and a lot of it was Texas oil money, that backed Joe McCarthy's campaign financially. A second was his fellow senators, who until the Army McCarthy hearings proved his vulnerability with the public, that they were afraid for four and a half long years to take on this demagogue in their ranks. A third was what I call the enabler in chief, President Dwight Eisenhower, who from the day he took office in 1953, had his brother Milton Eisenhower whispering in his ear saying, take down the bully. And Eisenhower waited till McCarthy took himself down during the Army McCarthy hearings. And the fourth and the scariest enabler was us. It was the voters in Wisconsin who overwhelmingly sent him to the Senate twice. And it was the American public who at the beginning of those Army McCarthy hearings in 1954, Joe McCarthy's popularity was at a full 50%, making him the second most popular national figure trailing just Dwight Eisenhower. And you actually have a passage in your book that, if you don't mind, I'd love for you to read so that my listeners can get kind of a feel for the language of the book. Great. So I'm going to start reading now. In The Final Reckoning, Joe McCarthy's liberal backers and his conservative ones, along with the Texas millionaires and presidents Truman and Eisenhower, are only partly to blame for the senator's rise and four-year reign. The enablers that mattered most of all in a democracy like America were the American people. Most who didn't adore him tolerated him, which was nearly as bad. Quote, no demagogue is an island of mud unto himself, close quote, Herblock reminded us, and Herblock was a famous cartoonist at the Washington Post. Quote, 
This one didn't exist without solid connections with the political mainland, close quote. Just how those connections were forged and where his support came from has been debated and analyzed for three quarters of a century. Wisconsin, which bred and elected him, was no more right-wing than the rest of the nation then and may even have been less so. It never enacted the kinds of anti-subversive laws that other states had, nor did it establish special loyalty tests or publicly purge employees from the state payroll. Milwaukee, its largest city, actually had a socialist mayor, and he won re-election in 1952 by a record margin even as Joe was being re-elected. The same Wisconsin that gave birth to Joe McCarthy spawned fighting Bob La Follette, young Bob La Follette, and their progressive party. McCarthy's most loyal backers there as elsewhere had less education, worked with their hands, and weren't members of unions. Small business owners and white collar workers liked him as well. Of course, Republicans supported him fervently, but the surprise was that Democrats were evenly split. More unexpected still was that while Joe may have disparaged East Coasters, they were his strongest regional base. There were two wings of pro-McCarthyites. One was made up of conventional anti-communists who said his results justified his ruthlessness. The second group distrusted big institutions, whether that was government or labor or business, as much as they hated reds, radicals, and eggheads. To them, what mattered was low blow Joe's thumping for the powerless, the rougher and more relentless, the better. Many of his critics, meanwhile, were less civil libertarians than snobs, recoiling from his lowbrow persona and from his Catholicism. His search for homegrown communists resonated with the millions of Americans who were frustrated over our failure to win the war in Korea, were still angry over the United States entry into World War II and the embrace of the New Deal and whose religion was evangelical while their wealth was newly acquired. When you add up all those blocks, it's no surprise that by January 1954, a full 50% of Americans felt good about the Wisconsin senator, compared to only 29% who were unfavorable and 29% with no opinion. He was a shadow president, which didn't escape the notice of the actual president. That is all the more remarkable since just two and a half years earlier, the same Gallup pollsters found that two out of three Americans couldn't say who McCarthy was. And as late as April 1953, 59% of respondents had no opinion of the Senate hothead. And the news in, 19, in that 1954 poll got even better for the Wisconsinite. Americans picked him as their fourth most admired person on the planet. Even at his lowest point in Gallup surveys, only 51% of the U.S. public viewed him unfavorably. He never succeeded in selling more than half of Americans on his crusade, said Gallup managing editor John Fenton. But by the same token, he never completely alienated more than half by his actions. In this, Fenton said, is the foundation of the controversy surrounding McCarthy, end quote. Richard Rovere added intuition to the pollster's scientific take on McCarthy's support. Open quote, he built a coalition of the aggrieved, of men and women not deranged, but deeply affronted by various tendencies over the preceding two or three decades toward internationalism, and in particular toward closer ties with the British, toward classlessness, toward the welfare state. To these and many others, Joe McCarthy was a symbol of rebellion. And beyond all this, he simply persuaded a number of people that he was speaking the essential truth." End quote. It wasn't the first time for America. Father Coughlin, Senator Bilbo, Governor Huey Long, and other all American zealots and populists had shown how many eager buyers there were for their snake oil. 
From Detroit to Jackson to New Orleans, long lines formed behind these pied pipers of unreality. Yet none of his demagogue forerunners managed to win the embrace of as wide a swath of the American public or for as long as Senator Joe McCarthy. Wow. So you chose to call your book Demagogue. Could you talk a little bit about why you felt that was the term that most needed to be called out about this man? So Lee, it's because while my book was front and center, a biography of Joe McCarthy, it was also a look at this uniquely American strain of bullying and demagoguery that went back to our earliest days. Whether it was Huey Long, the governor and senator and would-be dictator from New Orleans, whether it was George Wallace, the racist governor who ran for president a couple times from Alabama, or whether it's what goes on in Washington today, I think it is this deeper strain of demagoguery for which Joe McCarthy was the symbol and the archetype. It is that deeper strain that says to us, we are as subject today to buying into bullies as we were in the 1950s. And we've got to look within ourselves for the way to stop buying into demagoguery and the kind of bullying that threatens our very democracy. Well, Larry, thank you so much for joining us to talk about Demagogue, the life and long shadow of Senator Joe McCarthy. If my listeners want to get a hold of the book or reach you, is there a way they can do that? So they can. They can get a hold of the book by contacting any independent bookstore in their area or going online and buying it. And they can get in touch with me via my website, which is my name, L-A-R-R-Y-T-Y-E, as one word, LarryTai.com. And can I leave you with actually just one upbeat last word? Please do. So this was a book about the archetypal villain in American history, Joe McCarthy, but it's actually and counterintuitively a good news story. And I want to leave you with that upbeat message. And the message is in our long history of demagogues and bullies, given enough rope, every one of them has eventually done themselves in. And in our long history of we, the American public, buying into this kind of demagoguery, given the time we have always seen through the bully and the demagogues and rediscovered our better nature. So this book makes me actually more of an optimist than a pessimist. That is good to hear. Well, thank you again for joining us for this episode of the Modern Law Library. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast listening service.